Uh, we're going to talk about uh, employee oversight, and, and I, I don't have any distinction between nonprofits, just, it, just oversight of, of employees. Uh, that's me. I'm Mark Van Bitskoten. I'm a CPA. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and how I'm affiliated with National Groundwater, I, I do the audit of National Groundwater Association. I've been in the public accounting 25 years and serve a various range of exempt organizations and, and doing, uh, doing audits for those. So basically, you know, talking about fraud is what we're going to be kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And here is, you know, a, a, a definition, you know, deliberate act or failure to act with the intention of obtaining an unauthorized benefit either for oneself or for the institution by using deception or false suggestions, suppress, suppress, suppression of truth or other unethical means which are believed and relied upon others. There's a, uh, a statistic out there put out by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners that says that 7% of everybody's gross revenue is lost due to employee theft. And you know, it's kind of hard for me to get my hand, I mean, just 7% is going away, and we'll talk about some of the schemes, but it's a big issue. It might not, you know, you know, the, you know, the extra payroll check, it could be you know, mileage, you know, bad expense report. It could be stealing batteries and scotch tape during the holiday season, you know, things like that. But that's just a, that's just a big number. And that's what we're going uh, to talk, uh, talk about today. When we uh, audit, you know, our accountants, we've got to define everything. We've got to put things into diagrams. So we, we, we spend time talking about the fraud triangle. And all three of these conditions have to exist in our mind for somebody to be able to commit, you know, fraud. When we talk fraud, it's not just a stealing of assets. It could be fraud like misrepresenting rep representing financial statements. Is anybody here in an accounting department at your company or just all employees kind of? So like, so a fraud could also be where you misstate your financial statements to give them to your bank or your bonding guy, things like that. So all three have to exist. They have to have the opportunity so you have weak controls the person or persons committing the fraud have to have pressure. They have to have what's their motive, why do they want to do it, and they have to have the uh, ability to, to rationalize, justify why they're doing what they're doing. And if you look at the, the last two, that's on the individual. The top one, the opportunity, that's where the company, what's the company going to do to try to make it hard for somebody, you know, somebody to steal, uh, steal money? On the, on the pressure, um, you, you, you don't know what's going through your employees' minds. We've had some unfortunate situations and clients that serve. You know, there was one lady, uh, she worked in the accounting department, a nonprofit. Her daughter got involved with drugs and came home to the mom and says, I need $20,000 or I'm going to get killed. Whoever her supplier was threatening her. The woman had worked there 20 years. On Monday, she starts stealing money to be able to pay her daughter. She never went to her employer and says, oh, my daughter's, you know, addicted to heroin, has a drug problem, can't pay her bill. She just started stealing money. So people aren't going to, you know, tell you what's going on with their lives. They're not going to come to you and say, oh, I got all this pressure, I can't pay my bills. So that pressure thing is, is very key, trying to identify that, and we'll, and we'll talk about the, that. And the rationalization, that's just hard. What we all think in our minds, you know, why we do what we do. I was at one fraud seminar where the, the instructor said, you know, what's, how much would you steal? You know, if you could steal a million dollars and not get caught, would you do it? You know, well, what, what's your number? And some people took offense to that, and he went on to explain. He says, everybody speeds. He says, why do you, you know, you speed, you break the law. Well, because the consequence isn't that, you know, the perceived consequence isn't that bad. So he says, everybody has a number out there, and to be honest with yourself and say, what's, you know, everybody can rationalize it. What, what's your number is kind of what he was getting to that. And I kind of said, I said, yeah, what is your number? Everybody has a number. So at the end of this, you're not going to trust anybody is what we're going to basically say. So uh, there was a study done, and you can't, it's footnoted down there. It's the, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners 2012 Report to the Nations on Occupational Fraud and Abuse is where I where get, got my information. So they went through and then they and schemes by organizations with less than 100 employees. And the top one is, uh, is corruption. And corruption is, is like a conflict of interest where you take advantage of your, through your position at the company, you take advantage of some other relationship. 
So, you know, like maybe like some sort of kickback or something like that. And that, that's the most prevalent in these. And we'll, we'll get some other things where we talk about. But that's what they mean by corruption, conflict of interest, taking advantage of your, your position. And maybe you do, it does cost the company some money, things of like that. Uh, billing schemes, that's uh, related to, um, you know, where you're sending out bogus invoices and things and, and, and you know, and you're canceling a little kiting. Uh, expense reimbursements, that's the employee side. We kind of go, uh, you can read uh, down, uh, down through those. And, and who are the uh, perpetrators of these frauds? You're looking at there, we have comparing 2010 to 2012. So, you know, 40, 41% for 2012 are the employees, 37% are managers, and the owner executive is 17%. And I always think that the, the, the owner executive, it's their company, why are, they, why are they doing it? They're stealing from themselves, but we've seen cases like that. What's the age of the perpetrator? You can see there tends to be between, uh, you know, 36 and 40, 41, 45 tends to be the popular. So more of a uh, of a middle age. And here's the, a median loss. So for 2000, and we broke it up by male and female. So uh, $75,000 if it's a male employee, only 50 for a female. Um, and a manager, 200,000 for a male, 154 for a, uh, a female, and the owner executive, you can see the big discrepancy there. I don't know if they're, I'm a father of three daughters, I don't know what that says from a societal issue, but I found that to be interesting. But what, is, what is that saying that's saying that? The average, median, the average median loss for an owner, a male owner was 699,000, where for a female owner was only 300,000, is what that's saying. I think that is saying that the men are taking more money. So, but I don't know if it's. I, well, right. I, <laughs> well, I don't know if it's just because. Is that the loss by the man, or is that the man perpetrating the loss? That's the man perpetrating the loss. No, I, I think it, it, it's the man perpetrating the loss. But I don't know if it, when I say societal, like more men tend to be you know, in executive positions, more men tend to be owner. I, I don't know if that has a play. I don't know how you would factor that out. So I, I just thought. Um, how long have they been at the uh, company? Usually it takes them over a year to figure out how to do it. And they get really aggressive in the one to five. So probably, you know, you get an employee and they're probably not gonna start stealing right away. Probably gonna be there one to five years. The uh, average length of, uh, of a fraud, like a payroll, if somebody stealing through payroll, will go on for 36 months before it gets detected. For most other, it tends to be about 22 months. So these, it's not like a one-time hit. These things go on and on and on and on. Um, so this is specifically schemes coming out of, of, uh, of the accounting department. Before the schemes were just all employees, this is coming out of the accounting department. You could see, um, I guess I do have some other ones. The, the darker blue is all cases. The light blue is the accounting department. So check tampering, the billing, the skimming of the cash, uh, uh, cash larceny, payroll. You can see the breakout, the breakout there. So middle-aged male accountant, we should just keep off payroll. Yes, you should. <laughs> yes, you should that have the ability to rationalize, that are under financial pressures, and you don't have good internal controls. Um, here are schemes by the executive or, or the uh, upper management, and you can see that corruption. So this would be the business owner taking advantage of a relationship that they have. You know, I'll, I'll put your well in, and you'll get me, you know, Nebraska football tickets or something like that. That, that, that would be that type of scenario. Uh, we, sir, you have the ability to rationalize. <laughs> when, oh, that, right, when you're the owner, that's what I found that to be. So I don't know. That, so the, the lowest breakdown I could get of employees is less than 100. So I mean, uh, if you have somebody of 90 employees, that, that's, that's a big organization. 
It's a big organization. So you might have somebody out of an executive left, or maybe he's not an owner, but maybe like a general manager of a location taking advantage of it. And then, then it, then that's corruption, correct. So some ways to, to, uh, to identify, and this is, these things are out there, and so, you, know, you kind of step back and like, yeah, I saw that, but I just never put it all together. Like the first one, living beyond uh, the means, and you can see the breakout of the percentages. The, uh, the, uh, the dark blue is the manager, the light blue is the employee, and the middle one is the owner executive. We had a situation um, where uh, the wife was doing, was doing um, payroll. The husband worked, the wife worked in another company, and they're just kind of you know, going along, and, and the husband was my, was my client. And he's talking about buying, I'm from Ohio, he's talking about buying houses up in Michigan and jet skis and four-wheelers, and I knew what he make. I'm like, wow, how, how is he, how's he doing this? You know, good for him, nice guy, you know. But I knew what he made, and I'm like, I just don't understand, you know, how all this stuff works. The wife was stealing money from her employee, got like $250,000, and that's how all these things were happening. And so you sit there, and, and her company wasn't a, that wasn't one of my clients, thank God. But, I mean, you just, you see these things, and just now, in hindsight, I look at it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. That, that, but at that time, I didn't, I didn't, you know, didn't, didn't cause me to raise a flag or anything like that. If somebody's having financial difficulties, um, sometimes the next one, unusual close association with vendors. Sometimes you see that with kickbacks. You know, why do we always use that guy? Let's bid this stuff out. You know, you get some pullback there. Um, control issues. You, you see that quite frequently. Oh, I'll take care of that. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll always go to the bank. I'll make deposits. I'll always do that. Well, there could be some issue there. And some sort of, if you want to have a, a wheeler and dealer attitude, you know, kind of loosey goosey, you're kind of running around. Do you know anybody like any of these things? Um, no. <laughs> no, not really. That's good. Um, here's some other. Unfortunately, you're, you're seeing more addiction problems, more substance abuse, people, drugs or alcohol. You know, when I went to school, they were always talking about a good internal control is to always have people take vacations. And I always just thought it was kind of kind of hokey, but there is some, and it's not just that person takes vacation, that somebody else does their job, you know, fills in while they're on vacation. But you, you just can't say, okay, I take vacation for two weeks and nobody go through their desk. Um, it's interesting how many people leave behind incriminating evidence in uh, there was a uh, city employee of a, not Columbus, a suburb of, of Columbus, and the woman was stealing uh, what should have been remitted to the IRS for the payroll tax withholdings. Over 10 years, she got a million dollars. And the IRS was sending notices to the city, but she was in charge of payroll, so she would get the notices, and she just filed them away. She kept them in chronological order, but when they went to pay the amount, she would only pay a portion, and she would take portion. So she just kind of kept them at bay. But when they finally, you know, figured it out, they went to a drawer and they opened it up and they were all the notices sitting right there. I mean, I think they would have found her anyway, but why would you keep... So, if somebody's going to make them take vacation, you should go through their desk, not rifle through everything. You should do their job. You should kind of, you know, snoop around a little bit while they're not there. Um, if people are, you know, complaining about pay, that's a sign that they're going to have the ability to rationalize. If they have some past legal problems, if they have excessive, uh, you know, family or peer pressure, these are the same statistics, just in a different, uh, different format. There. So here's we're going to spend some time, you know, things that we can do. So we talked about the fraud triangle. They have to have the opportunity. That's the, the, what the company controls. But then it becomes pressure, and then the ability to rash, you know, to, to rationalize. So now I just want to talk about uh, some of these, you know, things you know, that, that, that can be done. You know, a lot of auditors, you know, segregation of duties, you need to have one person open the mail, one person to, to pay the checks, one person to do the bank. I mean, there needs to be cost of benefit when you're looking at this whole thing. You, you know, it doesn't make any sense to spend $10,000 to protect 1000 so you have to look, you know, to look at those things as to what you're, uh, what you're going, to, uh, going to do. And these are just 
not any particular, it's not like bank reconciliations are the most important, it's just as I was thinking as to, you know, what are, to me, some low cost things that people can do to ensure, you know, employee oversight. These are just kind of what I, uh, what I thought about. <clears throat> so the first one is bank reconciliations. Needs to be done needs to be uh, done by the appropriate person at an appropriate time. The appropriate time isn't, you know, three months from now, like oh, I'll, I'll do, you know, three months all at the same time. It's when you get the bank statement that you should be doing the bank reconciliation. Well, whoever's doing the bank reconciliation should be in a person of sufficient authority of know-how know -how to understand, you know, oh, here's this check. That vendor is a valid vendor of the company of the organization and the amount that we're paying that vendor is valid. Most uh, check defalcations occur with a double endorsement. It will be a valid a vendor, but you flip the check over and there'll be two endorsements. You know, so somebody you know, gets that check, they endorse the name of the company fraudulently, then they'll endorse it into their own account. So that person doing the bank recs doesn't just go through and yep, 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 it, it agrees. There's an internal control process to a properly done bank reconciliation. Um, with the banking, online banking, is everybody using online banking now? So you can see, you know, people say, well, I don't need to look at the bank reconciliations because I sign all the checks that, you know, that go out. And I say, no, you sign all the checks that are presented to you. There's a difference because if I'm stealing and I'm going to steal by a check, I'm not going to give you that check. It's just going to go through the bank. So when you look at the bank reconciliation, you want to, if you can download it directly from the bank, that's the best. But if you can't do that, you don't have that ability, get the bank statement unopened. So you're the, you're the first person to, to look at that bank, rec bank reconciliation. Nobody can, and I've seen it where they've dummied up bank statements with copiers and scanners and so forth, and they've done you know, dummy bank statements. And it makes you think everything's right, but they're not. So the integrity of the bank reconciliation isn't just an accounting function to see uh, that all of our deposits clear, things like that. It is to make sure that you understand what cleared through your bank account. Do you have a question? Okay, no. Um, to make you understand, you understand what cleared, what went through your bank account. With, uh, you know, wire transfers are becoming more prevalent, ACH transactions, making sure you understand everything that's going out of your account, you understand and you agree with and say that, 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 that that's what's supposed to be happening. So that, that's very important as to the uh, to the bank reconciliation. Next on here is you know preparation of financial statements, timely finance you know timely financial statements. Again you know if you're waiting three months to do any kind of financial statement to sit down to review it see what's going on, if I'm stealing from you in January and you don't do a financial statement till June your chances of catching that. When I say financial statement, does it's not the financial statements with footnotes, you know, probably a balance sheet and an income statement probably would be appropriate. And you should look at those and read those with an expectation. What, you know, what should I see here? Gee, I've been really, really busy. So you should see a higher sales number. Well, our expenses are kind of out of control. We got hit with the workers' comp. I mean, you should be, you know, have some expectation when you're looking at these statements, not just seeing how you're doing profitability, but looking at them for internal control. Say, what, what's going on with that? Why, why is that different than my expectation? Along with that, you should have budgets. Budgets, again, aren't just a operational, you know, here's how we're going to prove, but it, it's an internal control. You know, I said I was going to spend $10,000 on supplies. Why am I spending $20,000? You know, there's an internal control out there. The purchase of insurance, you know, bonding insurance and things like that, that's another way. You can tend to get that stuff pretty cheap to cover most, you know, most employees, like at $25,000. You can get that kind of cheap, and so look at that. One that, that's not on here that I thought this morning is, is hiring, you know, doing doing, making sure you're not letting that perpetrator into your, uh, you know, in, into your door through you know, references, background checks, things like that. Tone at the top is important. Um, you know, what, 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 you know, people try to mimic, you know, behavior. So if they see that the owner is being, you know, being abusive of the system, you know, supposed to take an hour lunch, he takes two hours, you know, he fills his car up his gas with the company credit card, things like that. People get to think, oh, well, he does it, it must be okay. So the owners need to, you know, they need to set the example as to how, you know, how we're going to conduct business. And it does get to be sensitive because, like our bartering situation before that we talked about, you know, install your pump and I get tickets to a football game. 
I, I understand that, but what, 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 what impression does that leave on your employees? Can they say, oh, well, my business will give them a free tax return because I can go see the Ohio State Buckeye place. I mean, you have to understand the example that you're setting. So that tone at the top is, is very, uh, very important. Um, look at the risk areas and think like a thief go together. I mean, spend some time and say, well, if I was going to steal money, how would I do it? You know, and you try to think of that way. When we go in and we do audits, we spend a session. We go, okay, if we were, you know, we were here in the accounting department, how would we steal money? What, what would, you know, what would we come up with, you know? And you, know, you just try to, you know, go through that process, and that's obviously would define what your risky areas are. Um, when we talk, you know, theft, it's not just cash. It could be product. Uh, we had a manufacturing client a few years ago that, you know, was uh, um, builds fuel tanks, and they were stealing, you know, a lot of the scrap, but they were also stealing some of the blanks, some of the, some of the sheets of steel, and taking it down to, a guy had a drug problem, taking it down to a scrap metal, you know, taking it for scrap to get, and to get money so he could go buy his drugs. So it's not just how am I going to steal cash, but, you know, is there raw materials, is there product, things like that. that and you need to, you know, try to put yourself, you know, how would, how would I do this? What would I do? And then you can look back and say, okay, well, you know, ex employee expense reimbursements. I don't, I don't know if that's pertinent. But, oh, okay, you know, I would, you know, I would fluff my miles. Every, every trip I took, I would add 10 miles. Well, does somebody review those expense reports? Does somebody say how long does it take to go here and there, things like that? Um, the fraud risk analysis, that, that kind of goes the same thing, looking at that. Um, educate your, your employees um, as to what is good behavior, um, won't be tolerated, things, things of that. The uh, established whistleblower uh, hotlines, and that's becoming more prevalent also. And it can be done relatively, you know, cost-free. Where you, you know, you put a sign up in the break room or something, and say, you know, if you have any concerns about employee theft or you know any illegal activities, here's an anonymous hotline that you can call, and then people can go and call. And, and it's and it's cheap. I mean, like in Columbus, it would go for like five hundred dollars a year, which I, I think is kind of kind of kind of cheap, because forty-three percent of frauds are caught because of an employee tip. That's where the vast majority it, it come from, is where somebody turning somebody else in. Again, maybe they're jealous, maybe like, oh, look at what that guy's doing, he's not sharing with me. Um, not to diminish my services, but only 3% of the frauds are actually caught by people coming in and doing audits. So the, the, the employee is, is key, and, and being able to establish an employee hotline would be, you know, would be, you know, it, it would be tremendous. They can. You want to encourage them to participate. So I, I don't know what, you know, if there's an anonymous box there, then somebody, you know, you know, what if I'm seen put something into the box, you know, with a 1-800 phone number, you know, it might be, you know, again, you, you want people to, to use it. So whatever would work for your situation, but just encouraging people to say, hey, if you see something, um, you know, here, here's an you know, anonymous way that you can alert, you know, you can alert people. You don't have to give your name or anything like that. Now, some people, like, they use law, you know, they use their law firm to do it. And, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, I guess I don't like that. I mean, I like the purely anonymous. I'm just calling some 1-800 number that somebody, somebody's there answering the phone. He might not even be in my state that who can take down the information. You know, if I call a law firm, I'm like, oh, that's Mark from Rain Associates. What the heck's going on? I mean, you know, I would try to keep it anonymous as much as possible to be able to get the information. But whatever would work in your situation. Some, some owners say, well, they all know they can come talk to me. And maybe they can, I, I, you know, but I, I think most people might be reluctant. But they might not know all the, all the facts. And they don't want to say, well, I'm just doing this to, you know, get back at, uh, yeah, Billy or something like that. So, like, well, here's, here's what I think. And then now it gets, you know, the information uh, gets, uh, gets out there. Rotation of job duties is another way, not just in the accounting department, but out in the field, you know, who does what, you know, mix it up a little bit. And to have a zero tolerance 
we have clients that people have stolen from them and it's over the, um, over the level to make it a felony and they don't prosecute. And I'm like, wow, you're just setting up the next person. They're like, oh, I'm embarrassed. You know, I just get them out of here. You know, they might make some restitution. Most times they don't and they just let them go and now they're on to another employer and they're, you know, after a year they figured out how they're going to do it. You know, they're going to, they're going to, you know, take it right to, uh, to the next employee. So try to have a zero tolerance, you know, discipline appropriately, set the tone at the top where all go, goes a long way to, uh, to stop in that. Okay. That was quick. Yes. All right, we've got a small company, less than 10 employees. Accountant's telling me, okay, we're growing. Last resort, don't hire an accountant. Don't hire a bookkeeper. Keep it all in the family. Okay, that, that sounds good, but if I can see that's a glass ceiling we're going to hit, as you can only wear so many hats in a small company. Is there advice or tell me I, these all are good things is there I'm not a bookkeeper okay I'm a sure. geologist turned driller turned you know, business yep. owner so how do we you know is there what's your, what's your thoughts on sure For, I guess I would probably get some uh, I probably would hire the bookkeeper I mean, I would go through a process of, you know, hiring somebody, you know, looking at references, things like that, getting transcripts, making, you know, um, we do police checks. We, we do police checks for anybody coming to the accounting firm to see if do they have a record, you know, what's going on there. I would, I would, you know, look at buying some insurance um, so to cover you there. But then I would, you know, the, the bank reconciliation, you know, maybe you still, you don't give up that duty. You still do that. I would not give that person check signing authority. I wouldn't. I would not give that person any kind of check signing authority. Um, I probably wouldn't let that person go. You know, make deposits. I would have that person just in there processing paper, producing financial statements to see to see how we're doing. Is how I would uh, how I would do that. And a bookkeeper is separate from an accountant, correct? And correct. A bookkeeper just does like QuickBooks per se. Correct. I would say I I use the term process as paper. You know, you know, they get an approved invoice to pay, so they prepare the check, and they, you know, they're just moving paper, you know, back and forth. They're not um, going out there and ordering supplies, you know, things of that sort. They're where the accountant would be over, you know, would would be over top of that. Probably would be signing checks. Probably would be going to the bank, um, signing loan documents, things like that. Sure. So you, it's not even as much fraudulent as I worry about incompetence, maybe. You know, but it's still my name on the tax the tax sure. forms, and you know, uh, but I can see it's becoming a bottleneck for us because we're just in order to grow, we're going to have to get more help. You know. I mean, I. I I think you get that person in there doing those things. You could review monthly financial statements, be able to say, oh, yes, you know, got it in the right bucket, don't have it in the right, you know, the right expense code, you know, what's going on with this. So you, you take that burden off of uh, off yourself and allow you to, you know, to do what you're what you're trained to do, but still have some uh, still have some control. But you're, you're, as an accountant, you're, you wouldn't fear that necessarily? No. I mean, I, I know if you said, oh, this person is going to come in and do everything, they're going to do all the accounting, they're going to sign all the checks, I would say, yeah, I have a problem with that. But no, to come in and, and to, to be an administrative support person, I, I think that'd be appropriate. Um, but, I mean, I guess we were talking before, everybody has their limit, and you just need to make sure that you have somebody with a, Thank you. an appropriate, appropriate thing there. It, and this isn't something that's static. It's not like you do this one, you know, like, okay, we have this bookkeeper, we have, you know, we have some bonding, you know, on them. Or, I mean, things are going to change, you know. 
And so you're going to, I want to say you constantly have to evaluate, but periodically kind of step back saying, well, are we doing, you know, are we doing the right things? What's changed in our business? You know, now, you know, customers aren't paying, you know, by check anymore. We're getting wire transfers. Well, how's that work? You know, some people want to get paid by wire transfers. How does that work? Who can authorize that? So you got to keep thinking about this stuff as your business changes. and it's going to change. People say, oh, my business hasn't changed in 10 years. I'm like, oh, it probably has. I mean, just banking in itself has changed. Accounting, saw QuickBooks has changed. I mean, things are constantly evolving around us, so your internal controls need to kind of kind of go hand in uh, go hand in hand with it. Is there, um, when it comes to accounting standards, when you get people referencing talking about codes for different line items, and you, you know, did a report, the bookkeeper versus the accountant, does the accountant know, or is there a standard for line items and codes that a bookkeeper should know, or say that it's a file that comes in that's already been established and a bookkeeper takes over? Um, that should be fine. I mean, there's no set saying like, um, like utilities. Some people put it to utilities line, and some people put it to an occupancy line. But I mean, you get whatever personal preference of the owners, you know. What business decisions that that's what it would come down to but there's no prescribed that so from a legal standpoint there's no requirement for a business to have 1800 is um fee no. or 1802 merchant fee anything like that no okay. no just whatever sufficient detail for you to do your job from a fraud standpoint and from a business standpoint so you can make business decisions i mean some people have a huge chart of accounts, you know, a bunch of account numbers. I'm like, how do you monitor that? How do you, and some have very few, you know, they have revenue and they have expenses. I'm like, what? Well, that doesn't tell you anything. So, so whatever, whatever works uh, for, for your organization, for you. What about auditing? Sounds like you do auditing. Is that something that's, should we wait for something to trip an audit or is that something that we um, set that in every five years to do an audit or We, um, our audit, we don't, I don't audit any publicly traded clients. All my clients are, are nonprofits like NGWA or, or for-profit businesses. And the audits tend to be imposed by somebody. Like NGWA and their uh, articles of incorporation say they will have an annual audit. So that's why they, because the, somebody 19, whatever, when the organization was started, said that's what we're going to do. A lot of times for our for-profit clients, it's the only time we do an audit if the bank requires it. You got to get some financing for a rig or something, the bank might say, well, I need to have audited financial statements. Um, so I wouldn't go out and voluntarily do an audit just because, I mean, it's costly, you know, I'm, I'm not cheap. Um, it, so there, there, there's a cost to it. There's a term, you know, that auditors come in and bayonet the wounded. It's intrusive. We ask a lot of questions. For like NGWA, we're there for two weeks and I have a team of four people and we're just running around getting documentation, asking people questions, you know, tracking down invoices, you know, from last year's expo. And I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a fun process. So I wouldn't voluntarily say, oh, I'm going to have an audit. As the statistics said, I mean, we're like, we're only catching 3% of all the frauds. I mean, our audits are designed to, to look for fraud but we we don't make any any you know any guarantees that we're going to I find. My thought on that was if people knew what was getting audited from there, they would ask the side to try to keep people from trying it out. Um, it, it may or may not. Yeah. You'll be, you can be astounded. I mean, the, 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 the one where I told it, the woman's, you know, daughter came to her. I mean, this lady was the nicest lady and God fearing. And I was like, holy, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. And you know, she broke down and cried. And, you know, thing, it was just, it was very heart wrenching because it was just a sad situation. And unfortunately, the mom made it worse. It, uh, it, it happens. I've audited my share of churches, and it is interesting some of the things that you uh, you see. You know, the lack of documentation in a church just astounds me. Oh, we trust everybody. Well, trust is not internal control. Trust is not, I mean, it, it's just uh, people that say, oh, I trust them. So, well, that, 
that's great. You can trust them, but that's not an internal control. I mean, these people could be, you know, stealing you blind. It, it happens. Comments, questions? Has anybody been uh, stolen from that you know of? Credit card. Credit card? You caught them by when the statement came through and you saw it on there? Yeah, I mean, putting. Um, I'm not a big fan of company cards. I understand you have, you have to have them, but you, you know, limiting the use of them. Um, our accounting firm. We have 200 people in our accounting firm, and, and and you know, there's might be like two or three people that have actually company cards. So I mean, when I travel, I have to put stuff on my card. Then I submit, you know, a reimbursement to my company. Um, I'm not. A, so I'm not a big fan of, of having company cards and have a lot of people have company cards. We had a uh, client, they do uh, cable installations for the cable company and they would subcontract out and they had locations in Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania 
and they, you know, tell the guys, you can take the truck home. If you want to take the truck home at night, you can take the truck home. But there's like a, maybe like a $15 per week charge, you know, they would get. Well, this one guy moved like 100 miles away. And they never told him. So he was, still, you know, they were paying for all of his gas and so forth. And and he just showed up to work on time. And, and he's like, well, you didn't tell me that I couldn't, you know, do that. Like, but you're... You're you doing correct. It was like, wow. And so that, I mean, you're never going to be able to think of everything. You're never going to be able to stop everything. But you know, to let them know that you're out there, that you're thinking about it, that you're diligent, you set the tone, you set the example. Hopefully, you know, you won't get uh, you won't get stung uh, get stung too bad. But by looking at your statement when it first came in, that's how you. I mean, so you, you maybe the guy you might. I mean, hopefully he paid you back on your credit card, sir. But hopefully you catch it quick so that they get you, they just get you once and go, we had another client, he signed all the checks and the woman would just put checks to herself in there. And so he would just, you know, roll the checks up and in there, and correct. And, and she got like six, she got like six, got $60,000 and they went to, you know, to prosecute her and they couldn't because, well, you signed the check. That's your signature. You meant to pay. Well, I didn't know I was paying her. Well, she says you did. I mean, and but she was stealing. I mean, they fired her, but I mean, they couldn't prosecute her. So it's not just sign a check; it's looking at it, and, you know. So thank you very much. Oh, you need a code, right? Does anyone want a code? Uh, B as in boy, M as in Mark. Two six. MV. I'll read that again. B as in boy, M as in Mark, 2 6, M as in Mark, V as in Victor. I had a follow up question on some of these kickbacks. Sure. We, it, you know, we get candy or different things to our clients. You know, we notice a sharp return of these things. But they say they're not allowed to take them anyway. Have they changed rules somewhere? To... Do you do like work for municipalities or? No, these are, these are privately you know, consulting firms. There, there's um, that, that nothing from a legal standpoint, nothing legislative. I mean, that might be just their their policy. Correct. I mean, at the firm, we're allowed to accept things of, of you know twenty five dollars or less. Anything over twenty five dollars, we have to you know have to you know report. Okay. But we don't get a lot of opportunities. Nobody wants to shower us with gifts. It's not, it's not a legal no. change. No, nope. I mean I, I, I mean I think if it was to like a government employee, elected official, right. you know, things like that might, but.